The first singer that I really liked was a singer by the name of Mel Torme. And what I really liked about him is that he was a perfect technician. Technically, his sound was perfect. His placement was perfect. His intonation was perfect. He was the first one I emulated. When I started really enjoying music and p listening to more singers and all that, I realized that Frank Sinatra had something that none of the other singers had. Torme, Sinatra. Jimmy Borges idolized and emulated these great crooners, but he didn't stop there. He took the classic tunes and made them his own, as they like to say. He wrote his own story. Next, we'll continue the long story short of Jimmy Borges, his connection to Sinatra, how he courted the love of his life, and how liver cancer brought him even closer to his fans. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha, I'm Leslie Wilcox. The truly accomplished singers, the ones we connect with, know how to tell a story through song. They hold us in the palm of their hands, evoking our emotions, taking us on a journey. Jimmy Borges has been taking us on that journey for more than 50 years with enthusiasm, love for life, and a gracious style that was influenced by his idols. Fly me to the moon, let me play among the stars. Let me see what spring is like on Jupiter and Mars. When did you meet Frank Sinatra? What did you know of him firsthand? First of all, I went to Las Vegas. Shirley MacLaine saw me singing in San Francisco, and she told her husband that I was the guy that would fit in with his show. And I went to Las Vegas, and I did. I fit in, and I stayed there. At that time, Shirley MacLaine was part of the Rat Pack, which was just forming. That was Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Joey Bishop, Shirley MacLaine. In, that, in a few other French guys. So my opening night in Las Vegas, this is an adjunct of the story, that it was a show called Holiday in Japan, and I, I went there to replace the star of the show, which was James Shigeta, another local guy. And so I went there, I come out for my first song, and there in the very front is Frank Sinatra, Sammy Davis, Dean Martin, Joey Bishop, Shirley MacLaine, I'm going, <sighs> And they all have mar martini glasses. And they're sitting over there and it says, okay, here's the kid, let's check him out, you know. And I, I was so nervous, I was so nervous, my mouth was so dry that my lips stuck <laughs> like that. <laughs> and so now, I was able to sing, I sang okay, and then Shirley MacLaine asked, to say, well, you know, what, what do you think of him? He said, Kid sings okay, sings good. He says, one of the things I noticed though is Freddie got a nice smile. <laughs> <laughs> a big smile. That was a smile. <laughs> so that was my first meeting and introduction with him. In the show, there was this gorgeous, gorgeous girl who was the only one outside of the uh, people that worked in the front that weren't in the show that spoke English from Japan. And so she became my buddy. And I did want to, I kind of liked her, but she wasn't that interested in me. She was dating Frank Sinatra at the time. And it was really very, very funny. She had so many funny stories about her. Her name was Shiz Shizuko. And she became my wife eventually. Certainly not when she was dating Frank Sinatra. Not when she was dating Frank Sinatra, but eventually she became my wife. We, she felt that there was some something in this young man that uh, it deserved more more of time. But uh, she introduced me to Frank Sinatra. I was really nervous when I first met him because I saw I, I looked in his eyes, you know, and his deep blue eyes. And this was my hero. This is the person who taught me how to sing, who taught me how to sing a phrase and to tell a story. This was the most important man. But this was my Einstein, you know. So he meant more to me than just being a star. He was the, my raison d'etre. He was my reason to be. He, this is why I sing. And so meeting him 
And she says, oh, Jimmy son, this is Frank. But by the time when she introduced me to him, we were, we were already married. So eventually my wife and I divorced. My first wife and I divorced. But we're dear, dear friends. When you're just a guy from Hawaii, you can choose to take a back seat to the world. Or you can dive in and take your chances with the big boys. Jimmy Borges always dived right in. I understand you're the only <clears throat> singer ever offered free access to Frank Sinatra's archives. Yes, I am. But that came with chutzpah. That came with the Hawaiian chutzpah that I had. I said, you know, the worst, I wanted to do a, a concert, and I wanted to do a tribute, not to Frank Sinatra, but to the music of Frank Sinatra. And I said, but the only way I can do that is getting his music. And I, I don't know him well enough to ask. So I asked Frank Valenti, who was here from Val Melissa Valenti. And I knew that Frank knew Frank Sinatra. I said, can you call Mr. Sinatra for me and ask him if I can borrow some of his arrangements to do a symphony concert in honor of his music? Well, he did. He called. And about seven weeks later, I got a call back from the Sinatra office, Frank Sinatra office, which was at Warner Brothers Studios at that time. And the lady, I can't remember her name now, she called, she says, Mr. Borges, Mr. Sinatra said that you can have access to his library, anything you want. And when she was talking, I noticed there was a, a smile in her voice. So I said, there's something humorous about this that's happening right now, but I'm not aware of. Maybe you can let me in. Uh, is, is there something funny about this? She says, well, Mr. Borges, the Boston Pops Orchestra conductor and Quincy Jones, they both had wanted to talk to Mr. Frank Sinatra, Mr. Sinatra, that's what they all called him, Mr. Sinatra, about borrowing some of his music. And they were afraid to ask, and you, who we don't know, <laughs> who we have no idea who you are, asked, and you got it. So you're, you got the music, and they didn't. And we don't know you. <laughs> so we think, that's, we think that it's very, very funny that, you know, that. Jimmy Borges from Hawaii got the music. Well, and how did it happen? Why did it happen? He sent people to check me out. I mean, really sent people? Yeah, well, yeah <laughs> so somebody came over to listen to me. And because if I was doing a Sinatra copy, I would not have gotten it. They wanted to know if I was a singer and my own. He didn't want my, a copycat. Right, he, exactly. And okay that was assessed they liked my singing and the whole thing and uh, went back and reported it to uh, mr sinatra i mean he took it all on his own to spend money like that to check me out before he allowed that and then when they told me he says let the kid have have what he wants does that Pretty mean much. you went into his vault i went to los angeles and I said, uh, uh, Dorothy, that's her name, Dorothy Ullman. She said, uh, just come to, uh, come to Warner Brothers Studios and uh, you'll have a parking. You know, your pass will be there at the gate and all that, and they'll tell you where to go. So I drove up. I went to Los Angeles. I did my homework for like about five or six months to know what songs I wanted because he would do, like night and day, had about 12 dis different arrangements. So I had to know which one I wanted. So I drive in over there, and he says, Mr. Borges, right this way, and they sent me up. I had a parking, a parking spot that said, Jimmy Borges, said, wow! <laughs> I, I drove in, I said, this is pretty cool, I love that. You know, drove in and got in, I walk in, and says, <clears throat> Mr. Borges, happy to meet you. I, I'm Dorothy Oldman, this is so-and-so, and this is so-and-so, and uh, you'll have to go to such and such a street near Vine, and there's a cottage there. That's where he keeps his arrangements. That's, he has a whole cottage just filled with arrangements, like 2,000 arrangements. So I went there, and everybody, because Mr. Sinatra said to treat him good and give him what he wants, I was a king. And there no money changed hands? None whatsoever. Did, Not only money, I mean, he gave it to me to use, and they took care of the shipping. The shipping for those arrangements were like four or five hundred dollars one way. Wow. And he took care of the shipping backward, back and forth. 
And he said, oh, yes, he said, this is just, these are for you alone. And I, I wound up with uh, 64 arrangements. To keep or copies of? How, what exactly I, did you get? It was to be given back at the beginning. And then I, I wanted to do it again, so I asked again. And he said, okay, just, just keep the copies. And uh, this will be, he wrote me a letter, he said, this will be strictly for you. As long as it's in your hands, it's okay. So I can use it. And so the second, so I have my own set of copies because of that. Spend any time with Jimmy Borges and you see the man doing what he does best, connecting with people. Shake his hand and he makes you feel like you're the only other person in the room. Much of that comes from Jimmy himself. His sense of grace is refreshingly old fashioned. And some of that comes from his wife, Vicki, who helped to nurture Jimmy's gentle side. about your first wife. Let's talk about Vicki. Because uh, you said there are two important women in your life, most important women, and that's Vicki and your daughter Stephanie. Yeah, Vicki and my daughter Stephanie, of course, and going back to my first wife too, she was, she, she really belongs in that category. Vicki came along in my life after my first wife left me, and for good reason. And I won't get into the reason, but it was, you know, it, things weren't going well. And um, when she left, it was very hard on me. And at that time, I just started dating everybody and the whole thing. And that, was, that really didn't work for me. And I was kind of lost. You know, my daughter and my daughter saw that. But nobody could really tell me much. I had to find my own way. And Vicki, she came into Trappers and she was with somebody else. And I, I looked at her and said, wow, I really like what she looked like. I just, wow. And I was full of ploys. I always had a ploy to do something. I said, hmm, I have to meet her. So I went up to, the, I went up to Vicky and the guy that she was with, who I had no idea who he was. And I pretended I knew him. And I talked strictly to him. And I said, you know what? I've met you somewhere before. I don't know where, but you're really familiar. Where do you work and all that? I'm only talking to her, him. After about four minutes of this nonsense repartee, he says, oh, by the way, this is uh, my date, my girlfriend, this is Vicky. And then I said, oh, hello, Vicky. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, it was, like I had just noticed her. She was the reason I was there. The minute he goes to the bathroom, I got off stage. I says, look, if you ever come here and you're by yourself and you, you, know, and you feel, I, I'll, t I'll make sure that you're, you know, you're watched over and that uh, you can be my guest and all that. And so she did. She came back one time and... and she came alone to the nightclub? She came alone. And what I liked about her is she's a very strong woman. She would not, she, she speaks her mind and she never says anything she doesn't mean. Very, very honest, bottom line. And we had a relationship that was very stormy at the very beginning because I'm, I'm a control freak and she wouldn't allow me to be control her. And. I liked that about her, and I liked it and disliked it at the same time. But I admired it, and, and uh, I liked the character of the person, besides the beauty and the whole other thing that was there that was pure lust. That was the very beginning, but I started to like her. I really liked her as a person. And we've been together now almost 30 years. But the first five years was, before we got married, you know, was a, a matter of just feeling each other out. But it was really good because I found out the strong woman. I, this is going back to my thing with, about women. I like strong women and what, what, everything I've learned in my life, uh, most of it came from women. And the strength, the gentility of it. She was gentle. She taught me how to be gentle besides her strength and by introducing animals into my life, like little uh, birds. And, and it, it gave me something else to, to, be, a, to be concerned about. And she brought those kind of things. She saw that, you know, she, she softened up my life. 
Cancer, the word that no one ever wants to hear, the word that changes your life forever, for good or for bad. Jimmy Borges always respects and appreciates his fans, but when he stepped into his battle with liver cancer, he found that the love from his fans went way beyond his music. How long has it been since your operation, your successful operation? Yeah. My successful operation was July 18th of this year, and um, I'm a miracle. I really am a miracle for many, many reasons. My cancer was diagnosed in April, on April 21st. Three days later, I was singing with a big band and I was cooking. But from that moment on, my whole life was consumed with the fact that I have cancer. When they told me I had cancer, my, fir my first thought was one word. I didn't say it, but I said, me? I had a perfect life going. My life was perfect in every respect. And all of a sudden, they tell me that I had cancer. It was surreal. I was scared, mad. And then you go through the process when I had to tell my wife and my daughter. And they helped me through it. They would cry on the side, but they were strong for me all the way through. How did you know you had cancer? I was coughing at home, and I had a low-grade fever that accompanied it. Vicky told me, she said, you gotta go to the doctor and see, you might be, you might be have walking pneumonia. Take an x-ray. So I did. I took an x-ray, and the x-ray showed up. While my liver, I guess it's right below, it, it caught the lower part of the x-ray, they saw a spot. We see something there that we want to send you to for a CAT scan. Sent me for a CAT scan the next day. And then immediately after, the next day after, that was an MRI. And that's when he told me that I had half my liver was cancerous. Grapefruit sized growth. Yeah, a large grapefruit size. It, they actually said small football. Small football. And you couldn't feel that? No, not at all. It didn't show. And I felt, I felt great, other than my cough and my low-grade fever. So I didn't feel badly about it. Then they, put, then they put me through chemo, a thing called chemoembolization. And it's a one-time thing. Goes, and that's why I kept my hair in the whole thing. But it goes right into the uh, uh, tumor. The dye goes in there, and the radiation, and then they pinch it off. It, it clogs up all the uh, arteries and blood vessels so that the cancer has nowhere to grow and go. Often when you hear liver cancer, you think, oh no, I mean, that's, that's kind of I like mean, a, the that's, chances are, are lower than most, right? Two doctors didn't want to do the op operation. One doctor, other than that, said I had a 5% survival rate. One doctor actually told my wife, who didn't tell me until two days after my operation, that he said I would probably die on the operating table because of the size and where it was. And my wife had to live with that and still show a brave face for me. So she suffered more than, and my daughter, more than I did, because they had, to, they had to live their lives normally in front of me and yet cry behind my back. I just had me to worry about and think about. And yet, with me thinking about it, I said, I'm a 76-year-old man. I've lived a great life. If I died right now, I got no complaints. God was really good to me. I have no complaints whatsoever. But living was important for the people who love me. And then I found out so much about the people who I've, I've touched throughout my life. Because they touched you back while you were sick, right? They came oh. to find you. Oh. With a, <sighs> With a vengeance, I got calls from the Netherlands and from South Africa and from New Zealand and Australia and Asia. And these people told me that my music had touched their lives. And I didn't know that what I did had made that much of an impact in their lives. That's what we all aspire to is to touch another person's life in a positive way. And I had. And that's the first time I knew first that I knew about it. 
it validated my choice of life and my existence. So now I go back and I have my operation and I'm declared clean. And now I realize that this cancer is not a bad thing, relatively speaking. It's a gift because it focused me on what I need to do for the rest of my life. What's that? First of all, God gave me this gift that I, I connect with people through my music. I have touched their lives in a positive way. So that, that in itself is enough. But it also makes me realize that I have so much experience in what I do that very few people really in the world has gone through as long and as varied a career as I have. I'm really nobody. They don't know who I am in Portland. They don't know me in Fresno. But I'm a journeyman singer who's been doing it for 56 years. And I've worked with small clubs. I've worked with the big bands. I've worked with symphony orchestras. And I've done it all. And this, there's so many lessons to be taught there, not just about singing, but how to prepare yourself for your career, for your life, how to assess yourself as to who you are. And this needs to be taught. And I need to recycle my knowledge. I need to do that. It's a mandate that I have put upon myself. Who will you teach? All, anybody who wants to listen, not any age, any group, but mostly young people. I want to deal with young people so that I can cut off the steps to their, to their journey to success. If it takes 20 steps, I want to cut it down to 10 or to five so that they got somewhere to go. And that I can show them that there's hope. And if this 76 year old man can beat cancer and be as vibrant as I am, I'm a very vibrant person. God gave me this. That's, the, that's reality. And I, I'm going to attack life. I, if I can do it, then you at the age of 16 or the age of 24 or whatever, you definitely can, can do it. And if I can, one person, take that and, and, and do something with it, then that's successful. If I take more than that, then it'd be fantastic. But that's my dream and that's my, that's my focus, that and my singing. And the cancer is gone? They told me that they got all the cancer and they didn't see any other cancer in me because it was in, uh, encased in my liver. It was in my, uh, my right lobe and my cancer was inside of it. It wasn't outside. So they looked all over and they didn't find any other cancer. And when they took it out of my liver, it was complete. There's a story going around the hospital that you sang going into the operating room, <laughs> and then you sang as you were leaving the hospital. Yeah, I did. I, you know, I wanted to, to loosen everybody up and soften them up and say, you know, it's okay. I was scared. What did you sing? The, they're rolling me in. I got the thing around my head. They're rolling me into the operating room, and I'm singing, <laughs> we're... We're off to see the wizard, <laughs> <laughs> the wonderful wizard of Oz, because, 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 because of the wonderful things he does. Da -da 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 -da. By that time I was sleeping. Uh, what so, about on the way out of the hospital? Oh, we're doing a thing from uh, the John Travolta, the, the, the Bee Gees thing. I was going, staying alive, <laughs> staying alive. <laughs> I was doing that. So. It made everybody uh, realize that life is a series. Th this is part of life. This whole thing that I just went through is part of life. And it's, it really is no big thing that I, I faced it, beat it. I won. I'm a winner. I won. And it's now what was once a curse is now a gift. It is now a gift because I'm alive and I'm able to take that, utilize that, and make something out of it to prove and show to other people that you can have hope. 
I'm, I just called Jackie Young at the Cancer Society. I want to. I just want to start just going to, going to hospitals and talking to young cancer patients, and older ones, and show them. I said, this is me, forty at thirty pounds. You know, thirty pounds lighter. I said, yeah, I look this as bad, this bad too. And this is me right now. And you know what? I'm seventy six. So in two and a half months, you've regained your weight, you've regained your uh, health? Yeah, and I'm stronger than ever. I'm stronger than ever. In 2011, the spring in Jimmy Borges' step has not wavered. He can still fly to the moon, and he still has the world on a string. For Long Story Short and PBS Hawaii, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Ahui ho! For audio and written transcripts of this program and all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. The spring, I would be a so and so if I should ever let you go.